loading a 40 foot container with crutches, canes, walkers, and wheelchairs. It's going to go to northern Nigeria. That's one of 20 countries that we have shipped into in Africa. And uh, we'll continue to do this until people no longer need mobility equipment. Which is going to be a very long time from now because it's just a continuing problem. There's no end in sight. So we need the mobility equipment that is stashed away in your garage. Crutches, canes, walkers, wheelchairs, baby joggers and bicycle trainers. Even the ankle boots that you see people wearing after they've had a ski injury. All of this stuff is so valuable to people that have absolutely nothing and are crawling on the ground. I saw a woman in Uganda while I was working with another NGO there in country that her right foot was touching the back of the right shoulder. It was twisted up from polio and she was using a, a fairly large fresh green tree branch that she was using for a crutch and hopping along on that and I was so dumbstruck at the effort that she had to put in to try to get anywhere. Uh, that I really, and at the same time, then I realized that we have so much surplus here that this stuff is just everywhere. I figure about every other house in the United States has got some sort of mobility equipment that isn't being used. Crutches or a, a wheelchair that grandmother had before she passed, and they, they just put it into storage, and you know, it never gets used and eventually ends up in the landfill. So I thought it would be a, a good idea to test that idea to see if, if we could move our equipment, our surplus, into these developing countries where they don't have access to this material. And even if they, it was available, it's so expensive that the people that are disabled, they have no resources. We're talking about people who may have a subsistence income of maybe a dollar a day. So being able to afford a wheelchair or a pair of crutches, it's just, it's unfathomable to them uh, that they would ever be able to afford something like that. So they're, they're crawling on the ground, their friends carry them place to place. So it's really surprising uh, how difficult it is for people to be able to move around. So that was the, the seed that started Crutches for Africa. First of all, when they make contact with us, they've got to have a good system of distribution. And a lot of times we'll go over and approve that distribution system with them on the first couple of containers that we send to them. And some countries then we leave to uh, their own accord, their own work, and they, they follow up and do all of the distribution themselves. Um, we work often with rotary groups. We work with um, different Christian groups, disability groups, but it is, um, it's, we work with any group that is willing to partner with us, and if they're willing to come up with some of the funding, then they move up in the line very quickly. As an example, if we have a country that wants a container and they can pay for the shipment, the clearing and the distribution costs, then they move to the front of the line very quickly. Um, but most of our partners, we ask them to cover the customs and the inland transport. So we cover the ocean transport, so getting it from wherever we load and then getting it uh, to the nearest port where they're going to be able to pick it up. So in a 40-foot container, we always try to get about 3,000 plus or minus pieces of mobility equipment. The more wheelchairs that we get on board, the less of everything else that goes on board because they just take up so much space. A full load of wheelchairs is 400 wheelchairs in a 40-foot container, whereas when we have a mixed load, we'll get 1,800 crutches, 800 walkers, 100 wheelchairs, and then uh, canes, and then the knee braces and other items as well. That all is what makes up the 3,000 pieces of equipment. And what's really amazing is that each piece of equipment costs $3 per item to get from right here in Denver, Colorado, or any location in the United States, $3 per item to get to Africa. And that's into the hands of the recipient. So if it's a, a wheelchair, $3. If it's a cane, $3. A knee brace, $3.
So it's a very reasonable way for us to recycle the stuff that we're sending into the landfill. People don't know what to do with it. They use it, and then when they're done with it, they just put it in a garage or a shed or out by the dumpster, and uh, that's not the right way to recycle. So we can help people become free, to gain freedom in their mobility uh, by the stuff that we have as surplus. So I had polio when I was a child. Uh, I regained my mobility really well. I did all kinds of sports and was skiing and ran with the bulls in Pamplona. And, but about uh, 20 years ago, I started having the after effects of polio, which is called post-polio syndrome. And that then uh, made my left leg a lot weaker. Uh, and I ended up having to return to using crutches and then I had to return to using a brace. So all of this was transitioning at the same time that I was seeing the need in Africa. And I was having the need myself and realizing that if I didn't have these tools, what would I do? You know, and I, I ask people all the time, what is the one thing that you wouldn't want to lose in your person, in yourself? Most often is vision. But think about this, if you can't get up and move, what's, what's left? If you can't get up to go to the bathroom, if you can't get out of bed or up off the ground, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, water is extremely important, and they're right, but if you can't get to the well, then mobility becomes the primary issue. Education is important, but if you can't get to school, then your mobility is, is the key. So in my thinking, mobility is the most important aspect of who we are and what we try to accomplish in our lives. And without mobility, we're stuck. Since 2006. It was on his birthday, um, November 4th, he had a slight heart attack. He was admitted, his birthday was the 5th. On the 6th, they said they were doing surgery. On the 7th, they did surgery that didn't work. On the 7th, they did two stents. He came home on Wednesday. We went for a walk on Thursday. On Friday, he had another heart attack. For health, and he went back in on Friday, and on Sunday, he was dead. He had uh, four more heart attacks, and the last one killed him, and he was dead for over half an hour. They did uh, CPR, which wasn't working, so they used the paddles, and they used them so much that they burned holes in his back. Um, he had kidney failure, his liver shut down, his gallbladder kind of enlarged to the size of an eight-month-old child inside of his belly before they determined what it was. So they just drained it because he was too fragile to do surgery. It was very dire. In the three, first three weeks he was in there, he was in ICU for three weeks, and they said, mm, chances are, end of life situation, let's make plans. And I said, you don't know my husband, just can you say that a little louder near him? Because if he hears you say he's not gonna live, he's gonna live to be 110. And there was really no hope for him to even live another week. And uh, within six months, his heart was back up to 32%. And then when he went to Africa in June of 17, it was up to 56. Now he's um, performing beautifully. All of his EKGs and EEGs and PRFs, whatever, they're all excellent. And doctors give him a clean bill of health. Of course, he is on meds for keeping his blood thin and everything so he can travel. But he's been back to Africa four times since his heart attack and has had no complications. But I have.